Welcome to Bluebird PS uh, from nesting to hatched and flying. And um, <clears throat> yeah, so I want to thank all of our sponsors. Uh, without them, we wouldn't be able to, you know, have Summit. And um, I'm not sure if they're, I think they probably already have taken down their tables and things like that. But anyway, <clears throat> yeah, go check them out. Um, <clears throat> So who is Dave Carroll? Um, I'm a DevOps engineer, uh, PowerShell developer, uh, not the team, but just I work with PowerShell, just like everyone here. Uh, I've been automating with PowerShell since around 2.0 days uh, in 2009. I've been blogging about PowerShell and other techie stuff since 2018. Um, I contributed to the PowerShell conference, conference books, volumes two and three, and I've created a you know, just a small selection of um, public modules. Um, <clears throat> and I've been solving IT problems for nearly 30 years. Uh, I've been using these QR codes because I think it's a lot easier to scan that than to like go, you know, try to click on the, or type in the link or see the link, especially from far back. All right, so let's talk about the elephant in the room. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> As of April 4th, Twitter Inc. no longer exists as a separate entity. Uh, additionally, there's going to be significant changes to the Twitter API access tiers, which is going to direct the, the impact, directly impact the functionality of Bluebird PS. Uh, we're going to get into the access tiers a little later, and also the fate of Bluebird PS. <clears throat> now, when I had the idea for this, talk, I was unsure about the future of Bluebird PS even then. But this session is ultimately about cradle-to-grave lifecycle management of a PowerShell module for an API. Okay, let's start over. <clears throat> this is the design and lifecycle discussion of a PowerShell module for an API, aka Bluebird PS from cradle-to-grave. <clears throat> um, so Bluebird is, um, is, was, is, a PowerShell 7 hybrid manifest module for the Twitter REST API. It has a .NET assembly written in C Sharp that I use primarily for output. And we're gonna maybe take a look at some of those um, aspects about Bluebird itself, but in general, we're gonna be looking at basic framework and structure of a module um, and, and what kind of design choices that you should consider if you're gonna create a module. <clears throat> So pretty much uh, that's going to be the, the agenda. Our design considerations, module components, maybe a Bluebird tour, uh, the changes, what next, and just a couple, like two or three links at the end. <clears throat> so uh, design considerations. When you're creating a, a module, one of the first things that it's going to, like you should really think about is, what am I going to call it? Um, Especially if it's a module that is, you know, could potentially, you know, gain notoriety, or if it's a module that's going to be, um, you know, uh, associated with a particular brand. <clears throat> so you want to be able to brand your own, uh, your own module. And I, I think I reached out to the PowerShell community, and we eventually got to Bluebird PS for for this module. And um, that started, you know, that was starting me going down the path of like, well, <clears throat> what's the next step? So I've got the name of it. Now, is anyone else using Bluebird PS or Bluebird to describe a, you know, uh, Twitter module? Well, first I looked on the PowerShell Gallery, then I looked in the, uh, uh, the copyright and trademark uh, government website to see if anybody else ever you, you know, have they used that? And I think there was maybe a Bluebird um, uh, client that was like a, a thick client, but it definitely was not PowerShell related. So I figured Bluebird PS is probably going to be unique enough, so let me get that. Uh, so that's when I started. And in uh, 2021, I actually registered the bluebirdps.dev domain. 
Um, so it definitely needs to be unique. And um, again, it's going to be considered you know, part of your branding. Just last year, I, uh, I had the Reverend Geek uh, to, uh, to do a couple of uh, uh, icons you know, and logos for this, so, you know, for this dying, dying bird. <clears throat> but um, anyway, that's, it, it looked great for a few months. I'm, I'm, really, it did. <clears throat> so whenever you're creating a module, one of the, the next thing you should think about is what PowerShell versions should I support? Um, are you going to be, do you need to support version 2? Do you need to, ver you know, support version 3, 4, whatever? Uh, and this was sort of a, uh, Greenfield uh, module from for me and I thought you know I'm going to just target PowerShell 7 it's going to be cross-platform I won't have to worry about the differences between the web commandlets between PowerShell 5 you know 5.1 and and 7 uh, and also 7 is a long-term service seed release so it's going to be PowerShell 7 support and that and that's it uh, and since I was the one that was in charge I said yeah <laughs> Um, so um, I know there's some modules that that have to support you know much earlier versions of PowerShell. Um, I, I don't know exactly how far back DBA tools goes, but it's that I think they support quite a bit. Uh, so the next thing is uh, is it gonna, does it is going to require authentication, and if so, how should the authentication be handled? Uh, the Twitter API uses two or three different types of authentication. Uh, of course, if you're using another, uh, you know, if you're going to be creating a module to go against another API, whatever they use is what you, you have to deal with. Uh, sometimes the, the authentication is going to be session-based, like with uh, the Dyn Managed DNS API. Uh, so with that, you basically get, you know, your, your token. Your token's good for maybe a couple of hours or something along those lines. With Twitter, you know, once you get your tokens and things, it's good and until they decide to change the, uh, the Twitter API, uh, which could be any day, you know, multiple times during the day. Um, so some of the, you know, some of the things that you need to have, you know, also consider with this is if I have, you know, long-term long credentials, I need to store them somewhere. Uh, so I created something that basically does an encryption uh, to uh, secure string and convert back from secure string and, uh, you know, just essentially had a hash table that I converted to, J uh, to JSON. Uh, we can maybe look at that a little later. <clears throat> um, but like with the Posh DynDNS API module, that didn't need to actually store anything. It was just going to be a module variable that's going to be available uh, so, like, whenever you do the connect, you're going to uh, essentially log in at that point and then, and then go forward. Um, but, you know, that, that also brings up something else, too. So, if you have a connect um, commandlet, you're going to need to have a disconnect commandlet or a refresh connection type commandlet, um, you know, if it's something that you do have to do a refresh. So the next thing is, uh, if you're going against a, a large API, what endpoints or what functionality functionality do you need to support? Um, you know, with Twitter, you know, basic functionality will be tweeting something, or maybe getting a user, or maybe doing a search. Um, you know, maybe posting something with um, uh, the Poshdan DNS API. It was about uh, you know, create maybe creating a new um, a new domain to to manage, or about creating a new you know a record, C name, you know whatever record that that you need. <clears throat> but you know you can't um, you can't look at an API. Well, let's say the graph API. If you were to start writing a module that is going to consume that you will never finish if you want to create a module that's going to consume every one of those. Unless you do it programmatically, maybe with open API or something like that uh, in Swagger. Um, but in, in general, if you're going to be doing it, you know, each command tailored to, you know, how you want to design it, 
you're gonna you should start small and then you know iterate through like with this version I'm gonna be adding this functionality the next version I'm gonna add this functionality <clears throat> and also like are the any specific product or API considerations um, that you need need to consider uh, like with the Twitter API um, v2 there are things called field expansions and um, ex uh, field expansions I think there's something else I, it slips my mind now but but essentially the uh, <clears throat> instead of returning all of the properties on an object they return you like a default set of properties kind of like the get 80 user where if you want more than just what they think that you might want to use all the time you'll need to um, specify in the you know the dash properties and and add those so uh, one of the things that I decided is like um, I don't I don't want the end user to have to deal with which um, which properties do I want? So I'm, I'm just gonna return all the properties. Uh, and on the expansions, it's like for like um, for a tweet, an expansion would be the authors of the tweets or maybe the people that are uh, referenced in the tweets. Um, so instead of returning that always, I decided to create a, uh, like an include, include, expect, in, include expansions switch for pretty much all of my uh, all of my commands so uh, if they want to get you know the uh, the users or like if they if they're going after a user you know maybe they want the pin tweet or something like that so the include expansions allows them allows the user to choose you know on the fly <clears throat> um, also like there might be different tiers of of uh, the API, like with uh, with the Twitter API, there's an academic research tier that gives them access to um, all you know all the tweets in the history of tweets. But if you don't have that, you know, if you're not an academic, then you're gonna be limited to the last seven days if you do a search. Um, so you know that. Those limitations that are part of the API itself needs to be included in your documentation, uh, just so someone wouldn't think, "Oh wait, shouldn't I be getting more?" And then create an, an issue. Then you have to go in and say, "No, no, no, that's not that's not the case." I think I'm backed up, didn't I? Yeah. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about the. Authentication for APIs. Uh, there's uh, OAuth version one, which is um, uh, user context. Uh, originally, it was the default for Bluebird PS, uh, and it's the uh, the Twitter API version one one standard. <clears throat> and essentially, you um, you call an endpoint, and you get back. Um, like the JWT, you know, the, the token. Um, and um, yeah, also uh, Twitter was one of the first originating co contributors to OAuth 1. Um, I think they, what they started like in 2006 became, and that was, became eventually Open, a, open API, no, Open ID. Yeah, Open ID. <clears throat> and, um, and then, they, uh, they also, well not recently, a few years back, added the OAuth 2, which is the bearer token, and that, that is the, the JWT. And also, um, um, you know, there's some, like with the bearer token, you only get the, access, the publicly accessible data, but if you wanted to do something on behalf of, you know, yourself or another person, you would have to use like the PKCE um, or, or some other uh, sub uh, authentication piece on the OAuth v2. <clears throat> um, so the next thing, you know, once you have your authentication concept, then you should think about 
your internal, your private functions. Um, those would include the authentication request. And also, when you're going against um, an API, not all APIs will give you all the data back. Uh, so like if you're on, um, on Facebook or on uh, other sites and you start scrolling and all of a sudden you see like the little wait symbol at the, at the bottom of the, the list, it's actually doing another, another API call to get paged or cursor requests from, from that API. Uh, and it requires iteration. Um, over the course of the, <clears throat> uh, the last three or four years of uh, Bluebird PS, um, I, I got the iteration down to where I'm not having to have like um, different uh, invoke, essentially invoke web request wrappers for the paged or non-paged requests. I just, I'm able to, to iterate within. <clears throat> um, the next thing is uh, you need to parse your output. Um, any responses that comes back, uh, you should consider um, having like an output type for your, for your particular command. Um, also, errors are output as well. So you should produce you know, proper error records, throw proper exceptions that, that will um, help the user figure out what they did wrong, um, or potentially figure out a bug that, that you actually created yourself. Um, for, um, uh, for the Bluebird PS, there's an invoke Twitter request, and then for like the output, I have a uh, write Twitter response that you know as soon as the app, as soon as the response comes back from the API, it gets piped into the right Twitter, Twitter response. It does things, and then if, ne if necessary, it'll throw a new Twitter error record. Um, and um, yeah. <clears throat> so, in general, best practices for a an API module. Um, or maybe any module, you should always do the, the verb noun naming scheme and it should be, you know, proper or approved, um, approved verbs uh, that you get from the, the get verb. Um, you should also consider using advanced functions. Uh, pretty much anything that, that has, uh, like if you have either the, the command that binding attribute or if you add any attribute to uh, any parameter, like uh, parameter mandatory or um, validate set, things like that, I think it automatically in implies that it's a uh, events function. And with the events functions also, you should consider being able to accept uh, input from the, from the pipeline and also use the, uh, you know, the begin, process, and end blocks. Uh, and I think there's a new block that's coming out soon, I believe, that lets you do cleanup. I forget exactly the, the, the name of it. <clears throat> um, then also you should do parameter validation uh, just to make sure that you know, what you're sending to the API is what they allow. Um, you know, if you're sending an, an integer, but they actually need a string, there could be some, you know, easy conversion. Uh, if you're sending a string, but it needs to be an integer, then that's probably not going to be a, a good thing. The, param the parameter validation also um, brings to the user, um, it, it shortens the feedback loop on, on any errors, so they'll be able to, to you know, if you give them the right type of uh, error message, uh, they should be able to correct the problem that they've, that they've injected themselves. Um, also, you should use the should process um, decorator, I think, maybe not decorator. Uh, the, you should use should process for anything that does remove. Uh, potentially anything that also does set, it kind of depends on, on what, you're, what you're dealing with. Um, and you should include module help. <clears throat> and that could be either context-based help or it can be um, external help uh, like created by Platypus. Uh, that's usually the, what, what most people do. It helps, I mean, it's a lot easier. 
Also with the module help, um, like with Bluebird, I have the module help is hosted with um, Read the Docs, and it's hosted at the Bluebird ps.dev website uh, or a URL. <clears throat> also, one thing to consider is um, maybe having some way that the user can go back and see what command that they've issued or in what response they got. Um, I, I've done this for, for this module and also for the Posh Dine DNS API. And um, a couple of years ago when I started working with AWS and using their modules, it's like, oh, they have their own little history thing too, so it must not have been a bad idea. Uh, so uh, typically for me that's a, uh, maybe a, a history class um, that you would have as a, um, potentially as, as just a module variable, um, and then you just add, uh, that's a list, and then you just add to that whenever you do the call. Um, and I think for, for Bluebird, that is where, when I do the right response, that's where I put that information. Uh, it's possible that it still could be in the invoke Twitter request, but we, we might look at that a little later. Uh, yeah, so um, if they, if you have, you know, issued a command and maybe you have a limited number of, of uh, times that you can hit that particular endpoint, uh, if you had the response, it might be easier just to get that, you know, from your local. If you said, well, I just did that, you know, 10 minutes ago and I don't need that fresh, you know, the data to be refreshed or whatever. So I'm just gonna go back to that and maybe not uh, go through and, um, and hit that API again. <clears throat> and also uh, in your module, there's gonna be two types of public functions. They're gonna be the ones that calls the API, API endpoints and the ones that don't call API endpoints. Uh, like the ones that don't call API endpoints will be the ones that does your um, uh, response output would be your error output and it would be uh, like any helper stuff or like like accessing the history of your um, you know of, of the commands and accessing the configuration potentially um, so that, that's kind of what I did with with Bluebird So I think Joel yesterday mentioned something about having the output type defined for your, you know, for each of your commands. Um, one of the ways he mentioned was doing a PS custom object with a type name. Um, that may not necessarily be the best way to go, but it is a way to go. Um, also, you can use uh, obviously a PowerShell custom class and or, or .NET class. Now, the bonus about, um, yeah, so, and, and in your function or your command that you can put output type. And for some of the commands like, you know, get Twitter user, get tweet, anything like that, and if you include the, um, the, the expansions, which means it's gonna get the other component, um, you know, users and tweets, uh, you might not uh, might not realize that output type can be more than one type from the same command, <clears throat> um, and you know it's like for the get Twitter user, it's going to be the Twitter user class um, object type, and then the uh, the tweet object type, um, and you don't have to like you don't have to worry about um, if it's a list or if it's a single, uh, just, just put the type that it's gonna be. Um, this is, doing this help is very helpful. So like when you're doing a where object, um, it will look at the type and then let you do tab completion for the property that you want to filter on or, or whatever. Um, one, of the, one of the good things about having a class, whether it's custom or .NET, 
is that you can use class inheritance. Uh, you have to be smart about class inheritance when you're using the PowerShell custom classes themselves. Um, you can't, you have to define the lowest level uh, that you inherit from at the top and then everything that is inherited has to be lower than, than the parent. Um, and uh, like for, for the Twitter object, that was like the, the, the very base class that, that I have for, for Bluebird. <clears throat> and it's got the original object, which is just the raw data that comes back from, um, from Twitter itself. And then the get original object that lets you actually return that if you need to. <clears throat> so uh, maybe let's get into a little bit of Bluebird if you want. Um, again, the, all of these commands, almost all of these commands are going to be valid until um, Saturday, <laughs> I think. Yes. All right, so I need to stop the thing. Is that looking good in the back or toward the back? <clears throat> yeah, so there's quite a few commands that I put into this over the years. Uh, and, and again, not that many years, just some. Um, let's say we wanted to look at anything that is authenticated or it has to deal with authentication. <clears throat> um, so I've got, I, I recently added the, the show Twitter authentication um, so I'm actually, I don't mind because it's going to go away. <laughs> oh, are you sure you want to show this? This is going to be some things that you don't want shared. Are you sure? Yeah, I don't care. <clears throat> so, um, this is, this is basically the, uh, the output. In fact, let me, uh, I did that again. Uh, I think I did that last night. <clears throat> so this Bluebird PS Twitter authentication, that's the class that I wrote. Uh, we've got these properties. Um, and this, when it lives on the, on the disk, it's actually JSON. And let me see if I can pull that up. Also, um, I put it in my, <clears throat> yeah, uh, I put this, um, your configuration for Bluebird, I put it in your home directory underneath uh, like a dot Bluebird or whatever. Uh, so if we look at the, the credential file, <clears throat> so this is just, you know, uh, encrypted back and forth. Uh, so you can't actually, you know, if you were to get this, you're not going to be able to do much about it. <clears throat> and so since I had a lot of um, um, custom or, you know, classes that I, that I wrote, I decided I wanted to um, do this. So all of these are individual classes or um, uh, enums that are out there. And I like having all of these, uh, the hierarchy. And since we have API v1 and API v2 are like drastically different, um, I wanted to keep those separate as well. Um, so like one of the Bluebird history, So like this is one of the things that would happen. So the last thing that actually ran was the uh, import Twitter authentication, which that has something internal that goes out and authenticates the authentication that you say that you have. Um, 
and I have another, actually no, this is just a new clean. We might do this, I think. Okay. Um, so, I'm not sure if you know this guy, he's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right there. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so this, you know, I just ran this command and then I can go back to my Bluebird history and I see this is the URI that actually got sent and the, the end user didn't need to know all of the fields that they need to do because like I said, I just wanted to give all the fields entirely. Um, if we were to look at, and, and again, this is not showing you how to do it with Bluebird. This is showing you what you could do with one of your own uh, modules. Um, so if we do this and then the data, actually API response. So the API response, this is the, the JSON that comes back and the data so this is the straight up data with um, the snake case and all that. <clears throat> um, and if I wanted to turn this, yeah, so that's, that's the actual JSON. Um, one of the things about this would be, uh, So include expansions, and now if I do this user, you don't have a pin tweet, huh? <laughs> um, but um, so let me, I guess I can show one thing here too. So let's do the help for get Twitter user. Yeah, it actually doesn't show that this has multiple parameter sets because I don't use multiple parameter sets. But uh, you can see that user itself is optional. Also, you can see that it could take a, a string. So I could do, uh, actually, that looks good there. So I'm going to grab these from the help because your help should always have all your param like one example for your parameter sets and also any other examples that, that may be necessary. Uh, so I'm doing a look for, uh, for, for the Bluebird user itself, um, Steve Lee, and myself. <clears throat> and um, the, way this, the way this works is, is pretty neat. Uh, I think I showed somebody yesterday. But um, so we got like maybe what, 12, 14 minutes left, something like that. <clears throat> Let's see where I am in this, because um, I don't want to spend like too much time on that. Oh. Uh, we'll, we'll tell Steve. <laughs> 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 Why not? <clears throat> uh, Yeah. Boom. Okay. <clears throat> so that just tweeted, right? Also, this editable controls, you know, if you had, if you paid for the blue, then you could edit until, uh, like, I, I don't know how long, but you can only edit five times. Uh, yeah, so this is the, this is the text that came back. 
Um, somebody yesterday actually put in an issue because they now have the uh, the free version, which does not let you get any uh, tweets back. So just the the endpoint that creates the tweet is one API call. But I thought that the user would need to see what they just tweeted, uh, you know, to either get the ID or whatever. So um, I ended up um, in you know in the command to go get the tweet that I that I just created. Right. So now I have to consider: Do I need to remove that and and then publish? Um, so let's. Uh, I'm going to get the get tweet ID of this because uh, there was one other thing too. I don't think I mentioned earlier. So if we look at this, you see the edit controls and then is that editable, true, all this is a comma thing. Um, that is because um, because I changed the two string. Uh, I overrode the two string on, on that particular class. Um, I like I like having these things as opposed to you know doing something. Uh, I, I'm, I think I have this somewhere, or maybe I don't now. Uh, yeah, well, I think you guys can maybe see that uh, it was in the, the the slide notes. So you know, instead of saying you know like public metrics, uh, Bluebird PS. Basically, the, the type name is what you get if you, because that's what the two string is by default. I like overriding that so it doesn't actually, um, yeah, I mean, and, and just do it as succinct as possible. It just makes a lot of sense. Um, so we can continue on here. So the, the Twitter API itself, the first one was uh, produced in uh, 2006, and V11 was dropped 2013. Uh, V2 was dropped 2020, and the new tiers for V2, April 29th. Hey, that's in the future, about two days. Um, the free tier is you can tweet up to 1,500 times per month. And that's it. Technically, I think you can also do get your own user, uh, which is good because whenever I have my authentication set up, I actually use that to get the like the user ID, which is used needed for some of the other API calls. Uh, and um, everybody sitting, if you want to pay for basic, it's only a hundred a month. <laughs> only a hundred a month, but this would unlock pretty much everything in Bluebird. Uh, so if anyone wants me to continue developing for Bluebird beyond maybe doing a couple of fixes here and there, um, I would need to have, uh, I guess, set up a Patreon and some, somebody. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's that. Um, so what's next? Um, should I publish a version, uh, 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 the last version, to remove like the error when publishing a new tweet? Maybe, I don't know. Um, you know, I definitely need to update the documentation and things like that. It says, hey, um, if you're rich, you know, and can afford a hundred dollars, maybe if you can afford two hundred dollars, I can I can assist. Um, also, the next thing is something like uh, one one of the use cases for this in my mind was I'm going to create a thing that I'm going to be able to. Um, publish like when I announce a new blog post or whatever. Uh, haven't actually done that yet. So what now should I do? Should I maybe create a new module that is just like poster or something like that and you can configure it for Twitter, for, for LinkedIn, for any of those others. I think that might be the way that I go. Um, and uh, Actually, as a show of hands, who would be interested in, you know, in a module that could multi uh, post against multi 
social media platforms. Okay. That's probably good enough for me to, to, to work on that. Um, so that's really it. Um, here's my three, uh, three links. <laughs> so it's my blog, same thing down there. That's my Mastodon account, and that's LinkedIn. These are my three primary places, not in the same order, probably blog, LinkedIn, and Mastodon. I might maybe do some, uh, some posting on, on Twitter, but it's gonna be less. I mean, I've been doing a lot of the retweets and stuff like that for PS Summit because, you know, PS Summit is, is worth, uh, you know, giving more clicks to uh, uh, dumpster fire of Twitter. Uh, so anyway, yeah. I think that's it. Anybody have any questions? It's just amazing you can finish off what they call you know, Mastodon. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the question was, have I had any, con any contributors, uh, code or financial? Financial, no. Um, code, I had one person, I think, um, maybe Alex, I forget his last name, um, in France, and he, kind of got me uh, interested in, in doing some of the new stuff, uh, like maybe a year, year and a half ago. Um, and then I think there was another person that originally helped me with the, um, or made some suggestions for the uh, authentication piece early, early on. Nice work. Nice work. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. So. Early on, you mentioned that you, know, you had to save a file you know, for you know, the authentication. The, the, the total. You know, where, I've, I've always kind of struggled with where to save that, you know, especially if you're going to use your profile on a platform. Um, so this is in version one, and you see this is ENV Home. The new version is. Uh, I have to use the is Windows and it's user profile. So version one, uh, Jeff Hicks, hey, I'm gonna download that, I'm gonna try it. Uh, it's got an error, dude. <laughs> Thank you. So version one, one, fix that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, just getting it out there and getting someone to use it. Um, and, and essentially, the home directory is gonna be, I would think, the best place. And then just whatever your module name is, Use a dot dad because that way it's hidden in some you know in some places. Um, yeah, the 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 question was where to put like any configuration files or long living files uh, for modules. Um, yeah, and uh, I guess uh, is anybody we got a couple of minutes. Anybody else have any other questions? Uh, all of this is up on GitHub. Uh, you can look at you know it's like uh, the Dave Carroll slash I probably should have had a QR code for that. Uh, the Dave Carroll slash Bluebird PS. Um, and uh, you can see how I did like my build script. You can see how I did the, um, uh, the .NET solution. Because uh, actually all that stuff I used actual Visual Studio, the daddy of Visual Studio code. Um, and I just found it a little, I don't know, it felt right. No other reason. Um, yeah. And, oh, yeah. So this is how, like, I create the, uh, uh, like, a last response. I think I did global, so I wouldn't have to. I, I don't know why I did global. I probably could have just done module based. But this um, this Bluebird, like, if, if you declare a module, oh, sorry, a variable in your PSM one, that's actually a module variable, and you can't use that outside of the PSM one. You know, when you once you have it imported. Um, also, I, I saw this uh, from I think Warren Frame, where he like when you do an ex, when you remove a module uh, from your session, you can clean up any variables or something like that. So, yeah. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Oh, did All you? Right. Yeah. And so. It's surprising that Twitter seems to have had that long a life cycle for the APIs, right? That's seven years of using versions, it seems. Um, it, 
it kind of speaks to two things. It speaks to, sorry, um, the, the, life, the life of a particular version of the Twitter API uh, was what was, um, was asked about. Um, so the larger the company, the more use that something gets, it's gonna create an amount of inertia that has to be overcome. It has to be overcome by people, and you know, I know there's like, there were different teams that, that worked on particular things in di different parts. The, uh, so did I find anything that was not documented properly? Yes. Especially, and I think prime, yeah. So with the version 1.1, one, one, um, the documentation, some of their tables was, was horrific. Uh, they didn't like. They didn't use a table correctly. So, and you know, if you have a column uh, for name on one down below, there might actually be something else of a different type of data in that. Uh, yeah. So there's that, and there were some just omissions, like in the V2 stuff. Like, hey, I can actually run this, but you said that you don't accept this type of authentication. I did that. Oh yeah, it's okay. Um, anyway. Um, so, how do we keep uh, an API module strictly in PowerShell, essentially, right? <clears throat> um, that would go look at the uh, PoshDime DNS API um, that is entirely in PowerShell. Um, And by the way, that one is also going to die in May. Um, that's because the um, Oracle bought them, and then they're migrating to the OCI. Uh, yeah. So this uh, Poshdine DNS API, um, and classes. I put everything in just one, and this is how I do my classes here. Um, I don't think I have any like methods on this, but anyway, I think I think that's it. I need to probably get, give this over to. Actually, we need to eat. <laughs> All right. Thank you.